Welcome to Pathfinder Church, where we're bringing together imperfect people in pursuit of a whole life. Happy Easter, everyone. My name is Matt. I'm the chief operating officer here at Pathfinder. And I'm Caitlin, the marketing coordinator here. We want to extend a special welcome to everyone joining us on campus today. Whether you're new here or you're a regular attender, we hope that today's service is a highlight for your Easter celebrations. If you need any assistance, one of our volunteers with the Orange Lanyards would be happy to help. You really can't miss them. For those of you joining us online, welcome. We are so glad that you've chosen to be with us today and celebrate our risen Savior with us together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's so important to recognize that even though you're on the other side of a screen, you are worshiping and celebrating today with a great cloud of witnesses, both here in Ellisville and all over the world. If you're joining us live, I'll be in the live chat, so be sure to jump in, say hello, and engage with me and the rest of our community there. Yeah, and whether you're in person or online, here at Pathfinder, we believe that Jesus brings us to a whole life that begins today and on to eternity. That means that we can pursue relationship and connection and wholeness in all six areas of our whole life journey. If you want to learn more about the whole life journey and what that would look like for you, you can find more information on our website. Most importantly, that pursuit, it doesn't happen alone. And people of all ages can pursue wholeness here at Pathfinder Church. For example, kids learn about and experience Jesus' love through our incredible kids ministry programming. My son loves kids ministry. It's pretty fun. Also, teens and students connect with their peers through CORE and Summit, our middle school and high school programs. And adults of all ages can connect and learn from each other and grow towards fullness through our seasonal action teams and pop-ups that happen all year long. Yeah, and no matter where you are in faith or in life, the important thing is that you belong here. There's a place here for you. We gather every weekend for worship, Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Sundays at 9 and 11 a.m. If you want to learn more about Pathfinder or how to get connected, uh, you can visit our website, pathfinderstl.org slash welcome for more information. I hope that today's service blesses you, and we are so glad you're joining us today. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. Happy, Happy Easter! On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They had found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified. And on the third day, be raised again. Anytime 
Yes and amen. He is risen. He is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite you to have a seat. As you're being seated, I want to welcome you to Easter here at Pathfinder. I'm so glad that you're joining us, whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online. Uh, it's an honor to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with you. And what a powerful way to begin our service. And um, not only though, um, well, I should say this first. I'm Dion. <laughs> Uh, and I'm Doug, and we're two of the three pastors here at Pathfinder Church. Yeah, the other guy's back here. Yep. Ginger guy. Ro guitar. Rocking out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, what I was going to say is not only is it Easter, but we also begin a brand new series today. It's called Living the Dream. And I'll actually talk more about what that means later. Uh, yeah, and for those of you that are joining us online here in the room, just know that we believe that God brought you here this time, this place, to celebrate together his resurrection uh, for a reason. So you belong here. We're so glad. So glad that you're all with us. Uh, and if you are new and you'd like to take another step of connection or just even figure out what God might be having for you next, you can always just text the word hello to 43506. And that gets, uh, lets us know who you are and lets us help partner with you, whatever God might be working in your life. Yeah, there's a lot of life here at Pathfinder that is just waiting for you to dive into it. Great community here. One of the ways that you can find out more about that is a one-time session. It's called Explore Pathfinder. The next one's coming up in April. We'd love to see any and all of you there. We'll make a big room for you if you all want to come. Um, you can find out more online at the link on the screen. Uh, and then a, a special note, we have a lot of kids with us, and uh, we always have kids' packs, but today we have extra special Easter kids' packs. Yeah. So even if you don't normally grab them, you might want to as kids. Also, there's a fl uh, flag in there. We're actually going to be using some of the stuff in the kids' packs later on in I church. I saw some people using them over yeah, here. Yeah, so people are, are already busting they're around. They're, yeah, they're, they're, like yeah they're, they're, you do it. You yeah, got it. That's right. uh, so uh, go grab those. You can still head uh, over to a volunteer at any of the doors if you need to get one. But, uh, but yeah, be looking for that opportunity later on in the service. Yeah, our service is going to be about 65 minutes total today. And uh, again, I, I'm, I'm so excited to celebrate Easter with you. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out, though, is that the story of Jesus doesn't end on Easter morning. Easter morning, right. Yeah, we kind of just sort of like, okay, he's risen. He rose. And, done. But actually over several weeks after the resurrection of Jesus, he, he goes around, the, the scriptures continue, and he goes around appearing to different people, trying to help them figure out what this all means for the world, but also, but also for them. And, and so um, on Easter afternoon, okay. not Easter morning at the empty tomb, but Easter afternoon, you know, after brunch. Okay, sure. Yeah. Everyone's stomach is full. Um, two guys go for a walk. They, they walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven miles away. And while they're on that journey on Easter afternoon, Jesus shows up and says some important things to them. That's where we're gonna go next in our celebration of Jesus' resurrection today. Two men made friends by grief, trudging home, each footprint led by sorrow, tread by confusion. Each step, showering the air with dust and fear. A seven mile trek from Jerusalem to Emmaus. A third shadow joins in stride, a stranger, face unknown. How can this be? He overheard them groan. The stranger finally broke their silence. What do you mean? He inquired. With their faces downcast and gazes upon the ground, they replied, You didn't hear? You haven't seen? The stranger's eyes smiled. Hmm. I haven't. Please, enlighten me a while. They jumped back, shocked. What? Have you been hiding under a rock? It's our Jesus of Nazareth of which we speak. A powerful prophet, priest, our promised king, who pleased God and the people, the man who performed miracles, a healer, a teacher, a redeemer of Israel, who brought the kingdom of heaven and promised to set our people free, a conqueror of wind and sea. Haven't you heard? Can't you see? The blind saw his glory. The deaf heard his words. The lame found their steps. We were living high on his wave of success. He even commanded our good friend Lazarus to wake from death. 
How long was he lifeless as he counted on his hand? Days, the better half of a week. However long it was, Lazarus was definitely not asleep. So why are you sad? The stranger asked, interest peaked. I am sad because Jesus is not here walking beside me. The Pharisees, chiefs, and priests tested him, arrested him, and sentenced him to death. And now we, we have nothing left. We had hoped he would save us, that he would lead us and liberate us, that our enemies would bow down before his might. That was our plight. It's now been three days since he died. Our friend stopped by the tomb the other day and heard the voices of angels and no stone in the way. Instead, heavenly messengers terrifying them with pure delight, telling them that everything would be all right. And to their surprise, not a bone or body to be seen. Jesus is gone, they screamed. The stranger kept walking beside them, taking it all in. Seven miles on the road to Emmaus, listening to them. They stopped for a moment, emotions overwhelmed. Their conquering hero no longer existing as flesh. I need to rest, said the disciple on the left. The stranger kept walking, his pace undeterred. Why can't you understand? The voice sounded calm, yet stern. Have you forgotten Moses and his words? The Son of Man would become the sacrificial lamb, and now the covenant has become fact, a death that gives life a final act. You believe slower than you walk, he said with a grin and picked up his pace. As they scurried to meet him, this Jesus, he asked, how did he win? Did he force the enemy to bend a knee? Or did he call himself the Prince of Peace? The question stirred something inside of them, a teeter-totter balancing act of belief versus grief. The silence grew louder with every single step. Arriving in Emmaus, appearing quite late, I have further to go, spoke the sage. No! They pleaded together. Wait! Come eat with us instead. The day is nearly done and our home has fresh baked bread. The stranger obliged as he gestured for them to lead the way. And upon arriving home, they all sat down to pray. Then, just like it happened the other day, the stranger took the bread, unleavened, and gave thanks to Adonai in heaven. When he finished his prayer, their eyes became opened, though his never changed. His scars suddenly visible, the face of their friend familiar, now recognizable. At the mere sight of him, the cloud around the table was lifted, a glint at their God, the speechless men were gifted. What happens next defies all reason or thought. One moment, he was there, the next, he was not. Where did he go? Their mouths dropped, faces perplexed. Was that my imagination? How can we explain? Did that really happen or did the wine go straight to my brain? And as I look down at the table, I piece together the scene 
and ultimately landed on what this must mean. While no man can fathom the hope that this gives, I know, I know.
Church, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in awe, in awe of your grace and mercy, and in awe of the resurrection, the reason we're here worshiping and celebrating. God, you made the ultimate sacrifice with your son Jesus, who died on a cross but the grave could not hold him and he is risen and we are saved. You brought us back to life. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God, I just thank you for everyone in this room. Doesn't matter if it's your first time or 500th time in this sanctuary, but God, you love us. I just pray that you help us shine your light and show the hope of Jesus to those around us, that we may be your city on a hill. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can have a seat. Our God loves us so lavishly. Not only has he brought us back to life, but he's given us everything we have in life, our relationships, our our resources, even our very abilities and personality all come from him, uh, which is why Christians should be the most generous people in all the world because of everyone in the world, we are the ones who know what it is to have a God who generously loves us. But what you might not know is that we really value generosity as a virtue organizationally here as well. That it's not just about individual Christians being generous with their own resources, but we as a church make sure that we use the money that you provide us uh, generously out in the world as well. So what, what you do to support us, it's what lets us put on programs and our weekly worship, uh, but we also are very intentional to, to pay money forward and, and to invest in other organizations around the greater St. Louis area. If you didn't know, we have the annual We Love uh, STL and Light of St. Louis Awards, where we look for other nonprofits that are doing kingdom work around us, uh, and, and we financially support them so that they can continue to do that God uh, inspired work, that life changing work. And through them, we, we do things like, like feed the hungry, clothe those who need it, provide care for orphans, widows, refugees, all those uh, who are hurting. But not only that, a couple of times a year, we do things like Missions Week and Prosper the City, where teams of Pathfinders go out and serve for these organizations. That we're not just financially supporting them, but we support them with our hands and our feet. We partner with them on the ground and help them accomplish the ministry that they're called to accomplish. But it's not just about kingdom impact only. We also want to just be people who love our neighbors, who serve our community in the name of Jesus. So we do things like host the baccalaureates for both of our local high schools, Marquette and Lafayette, uh, so that we can just pour out Christ's love in that way for them. One last thing to share that we really believe that every kid should have an age appropriate Bible so that they know exactly how much God loves them, which is why we do the great Bible giveaway here every year. And, and what, what you, when you give, you're buying those Bibles so that we can give them away for free to kids uh, so, so that money is not an obstacle for any kid knowing the love of God. And, and, but here's the point of all of this, that, that we believe as a, as a church, as an organization, let alone for each of us individually, that being generous on purpose is the thing that keeps us from turning inward, from becoming scarcity mindset, protective, uh, and and living in a a kind of a selfish hoarding. It's the thing that turns us outward. And every act of giving that we do individually or corporately, no matter how big or how small, is a public declaration to the world of how generous our God is and how much we trust in his provision that he pours out for us so that we can pour out for others. So if you would like to partner with the impact that we make here at Pathfinder Church, you can give a gift today by simply going to pathfinderstl.org slash giving or taking a picture of the QR code on the screen behind me. Or if you brought a physical offering, you can give that in the lobby, uh, in the giving boxes out there at the end of the service. But mostly what I wanna say today is just thank you. Thank you to all of you who have helped us provide life-changing ministry here for almost 170 years. And thank you to all of you who will help us continue to make an impact for the next 170 here in this place in the name of Jesus. Happy Easter.
We try this again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Back in 1972, the Summer Olympics that year were being held in Munich, Germany. And there were two Olympic hopefuls, American sprinters, uh, one by the name of Eddie Hart over here. Uh, this is Ray Robinson. Both of these guys were predicted to medal in the 100-meter dash. Uh, Eddie Hart actually had the, the world record at the time. And, uh, and so, man, this was, this was gonna be a big, big thing for the Americans. And I don't need to tell you that just to get to the Olympics, you have to win a lot, right? And you just don't get invited to the Olympics. You have to compete and win over and over and over again. It is a long and arduous process. And so both these guys, you know, they, they do their thing. They get put on the Olympic team. They're favored to win medals. They go to Munich and the day comes for their quarterfinal race. And they show up to the track ready for their race, only to discover that the race already happened without them, just to be clear. What had happened is that their coach was working from an outdated schedule and he delivered them to the track at the wrong time. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine what you'd say to your coach? But, but can you just imagine the whole experience? Now, now for me, I, I cannot, because I have these recurring nightmares that there's a church service somewhere that I'm supposed to be leading and I can't get to it uh, and I'm running late. So like this, this just, man, this is overwhelming to me. But can you imagine, can you imagine going home after being favored to medal, to, I mean, Eddie Hart, to gold medal in the 100 meter dash. Can you imagine going home without a medal, but not because someone beat you, but because you never even had a chance to compete. The Olympics are a place where lots of hearts get broken and lots of hopes are dashed, but man, that one is especially brutal, isn't it? But also, can, can you imagine, just, just imagine being these guys for a second and, and, and you know, all morning you've gotten yourself ready, you've gotten yourself in the mental space to, to show up and run your best race and, and you show up to the track and you're ready to go and someone looks at you and says, too late, you missed it. I mean, can you imagine the confusion in that moment as you're like looking at your, your, your schedule and you're like, what, what are you talking about? I'm too late. And they're like, too late. The confusion, let alone the heartbreak and disappointment, man. Now, now here's the thing. So often on Easter, we, we imagine that there was this, you know, kind of sadness and confusion, but then the women go to the tomb and it's empty and the angels say, he's not here, he is risen. And everybody says, he's risen indeed, alleluia. And then they go and celebrate, have Easter egg hunts and stuff, right? But as I said earlier, the, the reality is that even then, even when angels are telling them, people are, are, are confused. Easter was shrouded in confusion and doubt and sadness. Later on that same day, Easter morning, Easter afternoon, you heard this poetically earlier, Luke, the gospel writer, he, he's a doctor, not to be confused with Dr. Luke, that, that guy's a bad guy, but this is a good guy, Luke, um, he records what happens later on on Easter afternoon. And you heard this poetically earlier in the service from James. By the way, didn't James do a nice job uh, doing that? Yeah. <laughs> James, <laughs> James is still 15. Um, so he's up here doing big things at 15. I'm grateful for him. He did this poetically for you. I'm, I'm going to give it to you plainly. This is what happened later on Easter day, same day. The confusion still remains. Now that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up, in case you missed it in the earlier story. It was Jesus. He came up and he walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Now, I used to read this as if, as if like God had put a spell on them so they couldn't see it, you know, kind of a Jedi mind trick or something. Actually, I think there was, a, I think there was something else that kept them from recognizing Jesus. I'll talk about that later. But Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know? I don't know about you, I get this a lot because I don't really watch the news very much. And so like stuff going on, people are like, do you not know what's going on? And I'm like, no, I don't, okay? Tell me, tell me. Jesus has missed the breaking news apparently. Are, are you the only one visiting, uh, visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? 
And he plays along with him. What, what things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is now the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus there. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, this means going all the way back to the first words of Scripture, the book of Genesis, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. Now, now that's a teaching I wish we had Jesus going back to the Old Testament and saying, hey, all of this, it's actually about me. Unfortunately, we don't have that teaching. So you're left with me today. Um, and what I want to focus on is, uh, is what the disciples said as they were describing to Jesus what had happened, the things that Jesus intimately knew that he had experienced. These words here, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, but we had hoped. When is the last time you uttered those words? When was the last time? But we had hoped, but I had hoped, but we had hoped, but we had hoped that everyone would get along this Easter. So far, so good, right? The, the day is young, oh, things can change. But we had hoped for, for better weather on our special day. Weather doesn't get much better than today. Um, but, but we had hoped that our savings would be enough to see us through. But we had hoped that the treatment would be effective this time. But we had hoped that we would have 10 more years together. But I had hoped that this was gonna be the job for me. But I had hoped that, that he or she would be the one for me. Come on, you, you can feel their heartbreak, can't you? Because you've been there. You have hoped and you've had your hopes dashed. So, so these disciples saying, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We get it, don't we? And it's not like for these guys, this was some flimsy aspiration, the, the hopes that they had in Jesus. See, they believed that Jesus was coming to be a king, to throw out the Romans, to get rid of the religious corruption, to restore their nation's honor and dignity and glory. That's what they believed Jesus was coming to do. But, but it wasn't just a, just a hope or a wish. They invested themselves deeply in this hope. I mean, they had given up jobs. They had left family behind. They had given up everything to follow Jesus in pursuit of this hope. And they risked their security, they risked their reputations, they, they put, their, put their whole future at risk in order to follow him. So when they say, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, I hope you can feel their pain and their disappointment and they're lost because this wasn't some flimsy aspiration. This, this was a hope that they had poured themselves into. And I think that's exactly the reason that they could not understand the irony of this statement. <laughs> but we had hoped that he was going to be the one who would who, who, redeem Israel. And of course, that's exactly what Jesus did. That and so much more. But they could not see it. Why? because they were blinded by their hopes. 
And you know what that's like, don't you? When you get so focused or so fixated on some long-term goal, you get, you get tunnel vision. And that can be good, some, some hope or some dream. It can cause you to achieve a lot. But, but if you get so fixated on that thing, often you miss everything else that God is doing around you. You get, you get this tunnel vision that doesn't enable you to see that God was actually doing something bigger than you thought, that Jesus is actually the one walking with you along the road. They were blinded by hope. Now, I'll just say this. If if you're grieving the loss of some great hope today, I mean, these disciples, they saw all of their hopes die on Friday, and they were devastated. And, And if that's you, I'm sorry. And I, I know there are a few things in life that are worse than, than being in that place where you've invested yourself, you've poured yourself into some hope or dream and the dream dies, the hopes are, are crushed. I know that's an awful place to be in. And here's what I also want you to know, that you are not alone. That people sitting around you might be in the same place. Most of us at some point in our lives have been there. And so you're not alone. I know I've been there, which is why I also realize that what I'm about to say may sound completely insensitive. It may sound even even downright cruel. But this is what I've come to believe by faith. And it's taken me a while, but but I'm slow to learn, but I'm getting there. Uh, Here's what I've come to believe by faith, that some hopes need to die. Now, maybe you're thinking right now, how dare you? And you might be right. Maybe your situation doesn't apply. I didn't say that all hopes need to die. I said some hopes need to die. See, one of the things that comforts me about my faith in Jesus is that that we have the promise that someday when we go into the life after this one, the life of the world to come, I know that one of the things that God will do is he'll restore to me the things that were taken from me unfairly. There are some things in life that happen to us that are not God's intention for us. He allows them, but they're not his plan for us. Things that happen to us unjustly. And and one of the things that we believe from scripture that says that it's true is that God will look at us when when we arrive and he'll say, I'm sorry that happened to you. And he'll restore to us things that were taken from us that never should have been taken from us. There will, be a, there will be a reconciliation, there will be a, a restoration that happens, and I'm grateful that that is true. I, I long for that day when, when God makes up to me and to you all the things that shouldn't have happened when he makes those things right, because he's a just and fair God. All hopes don't need to die, but I now believe by faith that some hopes need to die, and I'm learning by faith to trust God in the moments when my hopes are dashed. Um, From the time I was in kindergarten, and no joke, I mean this, this is not exaggeration. From the time I was in kindergarten, I, I I had a hope, I had a dream, a vision for my life that I would go to the University of Michigan, that's where I grew up, that I'd go to the University of Michigan and I would study engineering. My grandmother worked for the College of Engineering at University of Michigan, and she'd take me along to stuff. So when I was young, I got to meet astronauts. And I, at first, I was like, I'm going to be an aerospace engineer. When I was in middle school, I got involved on the Saturday program where you would go into the university, and, and it was for middle schoolers, and you would learn the basics of, of uh, aerospace and aeronautical engineering. You, you know, you learn all this stuff. And that's what I was doing on my Saturday mornings when I was a middle schooler. And I'm like, this is the path for me. Then in high school, I got an internship in an electrical engineering lab. We were, we were growing crystals to make blue lasers. It was kind of new technology at the time to make blue lasers for different things. And, and I did that. And I'm like, this is, this is awesome. And, and then later on in high school, I had an internship in a nuclear reactor lab there on campus. And I was learning about nuclear engineering. I'm, I'm just telling you this so that you know how invested I was in going to University of Michigan and being an engineer. Like from the time I was in kindergarten on, this was my destiny. But then only a, a few months before I graduated high school, through a series of circumstances, God pulled the rug out from underneath me. And I ended up going, not to the University of Michigan, I ended up going to a small 
And, and by small, I mean smaller than this. Like smaller student body than what we have here in this place today. A small Lutheran college in Michigan that barely had a science department. And I had no idea. I, I just remember thinking, God, I don't know what you are doing, but this makes zero sense to me. I, I, I don't understand why that was a bad dream. I don't understand why I'm here. I don't understand what you're doing in my life. And, and of course, as a result of those circumstances of, of that change, my life now looks nothing like I planned, nothing like I thought it would. But I have now come to accept by faith that that's a very good thing. Don't get me wrong, sometimes I'm like, what would my life have been if I just would have gone on that path? It would be different. And, and my kids are like, Dad, you would have more money for us to spend on us. And I'm like, you're probably right. But maybe, maybe. I, they're fine, we're all fine. But see, by faith I now argue that this, this, is, this is a better life for me than anything I could have imagined for myself. So different, so different, but better. And, and I hope at least a couple of you agree that it's a good thing, that maybe God redirected my path. At, at, least, at least one or two of you might, might think that today, I hope. Yeah, here's the point. Just imagine, just imagine how tragic it would have been if Jesus had been exactly who those two disciples on the Emmaus Road wanted him to be. They wanted a king who would come in and throw out the Romans and restore their nation to, to power. And just imagine what would have happened if Jesus would have fulfilled their hopes, if it would have been like they wanted I mean, for starters, Israel would be the, the great superpower of the world today. They'd have political stability all the time. Uh, they would have the, the world's best, greatest king sitting on the throne, ruling in justice. They would be a true city on a hill. And the disciples who poured everything into following him, they'd be members of his cabinet, knights of the round table. Their descendants would be part of the ruling oligarchy of Israel. They would be the envy of the world. They would be living the dream. Sounds like a great hope, right? And yet, and yet, think about what would have been lost if Jesus had been who they hoped. Yeah, Israel would have been saved from their national humiliation and shame. And at the time that Jesus came, I mean, Israel was constantly being beat and occupied by foreign nations. And I mean, it was, it was an embarrassing time to be a Hebrew person. And, and, and so if, if, if Jesus had been who they hoped, they would have been spared from all that national humiliation and shame. They would have beat upon their enemies. But guess what? We would still be walking around in our personal, our individual humiliation and shame. And, and the temple would still be filled with the blood of animal sacrifices of bulls and lambs and sheep and pigeons for us trying to make ourselves right, trying to atone for our sins. Yeah, Israel would have political stability and, and there wouldn't be conflicts or wars or terrorist attacks. That, that would be true. But, but guess what? If Jesus had been who they hoped, the bigger enemies of sin and death would still be reigning and we would still be under their power. If Jesus had been who they hoped, Israel would be fine. But I hate to tell you that most of us, including me, we would be shut out unless we were born of the right family. We would be shut out from the family of God, excluded from the grace of God. If Jesus had been only what they hoped, there would be, most of all, there would be no life after this one. Which means that your best day on this planet, and I know there are some good days, but your best day would be as good as it gets. There would be no hope of a life of a world to come. See, by faith, I now believe that some hopes need to die so that bigger ones can come to life. And I ask you today, can you believe that this is true in your life too? That sometimes the worst thing that God could do is to actually fulfill all of your hopes and dreams. Can, can you believe that some, not all, but some hopes need to die so that God can bring bigger things, things that you can't ask or imagine, that he can bring those things to life? See, this is what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, and I hope you come back and join us for our series, Living the Dream, because we're going to talk about how, how we make hopes and dreams that are actually good things for us, but some of those things need to die so that we can come alive 
to bigger things, better things, more significant things that only God can envision or believe for us. That's what we're going to talk about. I hope you come back for it. But, but here's what I understand, that this is not much consolation, even though it's true, by faith. I don't think this is much consolation when you are in the messy middle of things. You know what I mean? When you like those disciples on the Emmaus Road, when, when you are walking away from a total crash and burn of all your hopes and dreams. As you're walking away from Jerusalem to an unknown future. I know this isn't a lot of consolation to say, hey, someday, someday, it's all going to make sense maybe and, and God's going to do something better. It's, it's still such a hard place to be. And so that's why um, as I wrap up, I want to draw your attention to just one other element, one other um, detail in this Easter story that we've been looking at today. Uh, here's what I want you to notice. That as those disciples walked away from Jerusalem on that Emmaus road, right, all of their hopes just dashed on Friday, hopes that they believed in fervently, that they poured their lives into, and as they walked away from the wreckage of their, of their, their dashed hopes to an unknown future, here's what I want you to notice. Here's the detail I want you to see, okay? You with me? Jesus was with them every step of the journey. Do you understand what that means? That even as they were walking from like everything they had hoped and, and, and totally disillusioned and confused, walking to an unknown future, they were not alone. Jesus was with them every step on that seven mile journey. You heard how he stayed and he had dinner with them. He communed them by his own hand. Not only that, but a week later, Jesus showed up to another disciple, a guy by the name of Thomas, who had deep questions and doubts. He had not seen Jesus alive yet. He didn't understand what this could mean. And Jesus showed up to Thomas personally and said, Thomas, wh what is it that you need? I want to help you move forward in your life. I want to help you leave this dashed hope behind. I want to lead you to a better hope. Look at my hands. Look at my wounds. Look at my side. Stop doubting and believe. Another time he showed up to a guy by the name of Peter and Peter had been so crushed by disappointment. Not just the disappointment of Jesus dying, but Peter was so crushed by his own disappointment in himself because he had denied Jesus when Jesus needed him most. And, and so Peter assumed that he was done. He was a has-been. He was washed up. He assumed that there was no future for him except to go back to his previous life. And Jesus shows up while Peter is out fishing because that's what he used to do for a living and Jesus calls to him and, and he begins to help Peter see the path that he has for him. And it's a good thing because as a result of that conversation, Peter changed the world. He became one of the greatest leaders in the church. Do you know that Jesus appeared to over 500 people between his resurrection and his ascension, helping each of them move from their dashed hopes to a bigger hope? a clearer picture of what he was doing in the world and what he had in mind for them. And here's what I want you to know. That's not just for them. That's the story of my life too. I now realize that even when I've been walking from dashed hopes to an unknown future, I've never been alone. Jesus has always been with me. And sometimes I've not had the eyes to see him. I, my, 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 you know, my tunnel vision has kept me from seeing his presence with me. But looking back, I know I know and I want you to know that he's with me and he's with you every step you take as you try to discover the hopes and the dreams that he has for your future. And, and so here's what I hope for you. I, I hope that today you can open up your heart and you can receive the risen King Jesus. That you can know that he's not only your savior who, who will get you into eternal life someday, but he is your loving shepherd who wants to guide you every step you take on life's journey. Just open up your life to him. Open up your eyes to see him. He's just as present today as he was with those disciples on the Emmaus Road. But like them, we often don't see him, do we? Because we're so caught up, we're so fixated on the stuff of life. But I promise you, he's here, he's with you, and he would love to lead you to what he has in store for you, the hopes and the dreams that are so much bigger than anything you could dream for yourself. And so here's what I wanna do as we wrap this up. 
I want to ask you, if you can believe, even if, even if a small part of you can believe that this is true, that Jesus is always with you and he will always show up for you in the great moments of life, but also in those moments when your hopes are dashed, when your dreams are crushed. If you believe in those moments that you are not alone, but God is so good that he is present, he will guide you to a bigger hope or dream. Even if that's hard for you to believe because you're reeling right now from the loss of some great hope, is there a part of you today that can believe that's true? And if so, if so, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to get up on your feet right now. Stand up on your feet. And as the musicians all come back out and the vocalists come back out, I'm gonna invite you to sing this song of praise and trust that God is with us. Declare your trust in Him because the scriptures say that if we have a faith the size of a mustard seed, a tiny seed, that God will cause that to grow into something that will flourish, that will be a blessing to the world around us and a blessing to us. So today, wherever you are in life, can you put your trust in Jesus? Can you praise Jesus for being with you and having bigger hopes and dreams in mind for you than anything you could ever dream for yourself? If so, let's sing this song together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. It's a good time for you to get your flags out of your kickbacks. Let's put our hands together and repeat after us. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
Well, I really love when we take the songs literally, uh, so we won't be quiet. It is That's loud, true. loud in this place because this amazing things happen. We're praising the Lord. Yeah, before you go, we just want to share with you a couple of things. Um, again, we have a lot of life-giving things that are happening here at Pathfinder. The shortcut to knowing what's going on is the Pathfinder Guide. It will give you the top three things each week. You can get it by scanning the code or text the word Pathfinder to 43506. And then take the extra step to subscribe so you get it automatically. Then you always know. That's right. And we hope you'll continue with us over the next couple of weeks in the series Living the Dream. We're going to be looking each week at a different dream that we have. And they're good dreams. They're dreams that all of us tend to have. And, and it's seeing how God has something better for us if we're just willing to, to lean into what he has to say. Yeah, again, we are so grateful that you joined us here this Easter. And I do pray God's blessings over the rest of your day, that the family stuff would go well, that uh, God would give you just a great day of celebration, that he'd fill you with life, and that he'd guide you to whatever it is he has next for you. Uh, Doug and I will be down front after the service if you need prayer for anything, but now receive a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Now depart in peace in. Serve the Lord. He is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah.
Thank you for joining us and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new, you can find helpful links to resources in the description below or at pathfinderstl.org. Yeah, and while you're there, you can also find our message podcast, which allow you to listen to our weekend messages on the go. So whatever you're doing or wherever you are, you'll never miss out on a message from us. Also, Jesus rose so that everyone would have a new life, which is the best news. And we want to share that with others and bless them with it. So would you consider sharing this experience with someone who might need that news today? Mm -hmm. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, ring the bell to be notified whenever we post new content here, like and comment. Every interaction helps this message spread. It sure does. And finally, it's your generosity that fuels our work here at Pathfinder Church. When you give, you not only support the work that happens on this campus, but the work in our community and the work of our mission partners around the world. We are so glad that you joined us today and we hope you join us again next time. Happy Easter. Have a great week.